In this video, we're going to talk about the differences between light microscopes and electron microscopes. We're going to talk about the basic principles behind the two types of microscopes and what scenarios one might be more beneficial than the other. Let's get started. Light microscopes and electron microscopes are the two main classifications for microscopes. In order to determine what type of microscope you might need to use, it's important to understand the size of the organism you are studying and what type of detail you might want to observe in that organism. You should notice that light microscopes are beneficial to use from about the range of what the human eye can see down to about one micrometer in size. If you want to see something smaller than a micrometer, you're going to need to use an electron microscope, which will allow you to view specimens all the way down to 10 nanometers. One nice feature of your Microbiology of the Human Experience textbook is that all the microscopy images are labeled in the corner that indicate what type of microscope was used to take the image. Notice these labels as you read because it will help you better understand the types of microscopy that the images were generated with. We're going to compare two different microscopes, light microscopes and electron microscopes. First, we'll look at the light microscope. There are actually many different types of light microscopes that we're going to discuss in the next video. So for this talk, we're just going to focus on the basic properties of how a light microscope functions. A light microscope is typically the type of microscope that are used to seeing in the lab. They have a maximum magnification of about a thousand times, although there are very few high-end light microscopes that can magnify up to 1500 times. You can resolve an image down to about 200 nanometers, which means that if two cells or structures are closer together than 200 nanometers, you will not be able to tell that they are separate objects. The majority of light microscopes are compound microscopes, which means that they have two lenses. The ocular lens, also known as the eyepiece that you look through, and the objective lenses that are located right above the stage here. The total magnification for the microscope is the multiplication of the two lenses together. The ocular is a set magnification of 10 times, but the objective typically has multiple lenses, so you can change the magnification. For example, you could set the objective lens to a 40x lens, which would give you a total magnification of 40 times 10, which is 400 times. There's also a third lens on the microscope called the condenser lens. It's actually found down underneath the stage itself, so it's under the specimen. This is not used for magnification, but its job is to condense the light into a narrow focus so that it will pass by the specimen and into the objective lens as you're observing the image. Light microscopes work because of the physical properties of light. Remember that light is a form of kinetic energy. It is physically moving through space, traveling as light waves. Different types of colors of light have different wavelengths as measured from the top of one wave to the next. So as you look at a wavelength of light, the measurement from here to here will tell you what that wavelength is. Shorter wavelengths of light would look like this, where the waves are closer together. Light microscopes use visible light that shines from a light source at the base of the microscope and passes through the condenser lens. Notice the light beam has been getting wider as it was leaving the light source, and after it goes through the condenser, the condenser has refracted that light so that now it will come back together at a pinpoint place. This is important because we don't want a big circle of light Instead, the condenser lens causes the waves to refract into the objective lens so we can visualize what we are looking at. Refraction is a key property of light, as it's what causes the magnification as the light is refracted through the different lenses of the microscope. You've probably seen refraction if you've ever looked at something that was partially submerged and it looked like it was bent, even though you know it's not, like this pipe in this picture here. As light waves travel through different substances, the angle they travel at changes, leading to refraction. Light can also be absorbed or reflected or scattered by a substance, which is what allows us to visualize the contrast of the specimen in the microscope. 
My microscopes are able to resolve objects as long as there is contrast between the object and the background, and the wavelength of light is small enough to pass by the object. The resolution of a light microscope can be calculated by the equation lambda, which is the wavelength, divided by 2 times the numerical aperture. The numerical aperture is a property of the quality of the lens itself and cannot be changed. So the only variable in this equation is the wavelength of light. The smaller the wavelength, the smaller the resolution, which means the better the resolving power. This is highlighted in the image with the circles and the star. In the top image, the large circles are representing large wavelengths of light. You can tell that they can get by the object, but only so many of them can fit into the space around the object. When you move the object, you can see that it used to be there, but it's not very clear. It's a little bit hard to tell what that shape had been. Compare this now to smaller wavelengths of light represented by the purple circles. More of those can fill in among the space because they take up less room. Now when you remove the object, it's much easier to tell you see a much clearer image of what that object had been. This is the same concept in a microscope. One way to improve resolution using a specific lens is called the oil immersion technique. Whenever using the 100x objective, you actually have to put oil on the slide to fill the space between the slide and the objective. This is because the lens is so close to the slide that the air refracts the light and it doesn't enter the objective properly. Instead, you fill that space here with oil, which prevents the light from refracting and allows it to properly enter the objective, improving the resolution of that objective lens. Whenever you are refracting light through a lens, the light beams are traveling back towards each other. They will come together. It is what is called the focal point. In order to view your magnified image, the specimen must be located at this focal point, because if not, it will be blurry, such as the image here, where you're actually too close, so you're in front of the focal point, or the image here, where you're too far away, so you're behind the focal point. The focal point controls where the objective lens has to be positioned over the slide, and that distance is often referred to as the depth of field or the focal length. Now that you have a general understanding of how a light microscope works, we'll take a look at how an electron microscope differs from a light microscope. The first thing you should notice is that this electron microscope looks very different than the light microscopes you're used to seeing. Electron microscopes replace wavelengths of light with beams of electrons, and they use magnets to bend the electron beam instead of lenses. And so there's a beam of electrons coming down through here, this is a vacuum so that those electrons can travel, and along the way they are being bent and refracted by various magnets until they get to the specimen, which is located down at the base of the microscope. Electrons do move in waves, similar to light. However, the wavelength of a beam of electrons is much smaller, at about four thousandths of a nanometer. If you remember the equation for resolution, a wavelength this tiny means that the electron microscopes have a much higher resolving power and allow you to see very detailed images. In fact, the maximum resolution of electron microscope is about 0.1 nanometers, while the maximum magnification is about 500,000 times. There are two main types of electron microscopes, scanning electron microscopes or transmission electron microscopes. First, we'll look at a scanning electron microscope. Scanning electron microscopes are used to form images of specimen surfaces and produce very detailed 3D images. In order for an SEM to work, the specimen has to be coated in a thin letter of metal, typically gold. This allows the electrons to scatter off the surface when the electron volume hits the specimen, and the scattered electrons are collected by a detector to form the image. Here we'll look at some examples of electron micrographs from an SEM. In this image, we see pollen grains of various shapes and sizes. This one is a blood clot. You can actually see the fibrous clotting material here with embedded red blood cells spread throughout it. This is a spirochete. This is actually Borrelia burgdorferi, which is the causative agent of Lyme disease. And this last image is the infamous SARS coronavirus that we're currently hearing so much about. 
you can actually see the spikes as little lumps along the surface of the virus itself. These spikes have been talked about a lot in the news because their role in attachment to cells and their importance for vaccine development. Transmission electron microscopes are used to examine internal structures of cells, such as organelles. This means that instead of scattering off the top, the electrons pass through the specimen, leading to different opacity based on the ease of transfer. To do this, you must have very thin, less than 100 nanometer slices of the cell or tissue you want to study. You can typically tell if an electron micrograph was made using an SEM or a TEM. So here are a few TEM images. This first cell is eosinophil, which is one of the cells of your immune system. And these dark spots within it are vesicles that are filled with histamine. These are called granules, and if you're currently dealing with seasonal allergies, you can thank these guys. This next image is a cross-section of a eukaryotic flagella, sewing the different patterns of microtubules inside the membrane that allow for the flagella to move back and forth. Here we see the internal structure of a bacterial cell. I want you to notice that there is structure there. So while prokaryotes don't have membrane-bound organelles, they do have internal structures, which we'll talk about in another chapter. And here again is the infamous coronavirus. This image, because it's now a cross-section instead of the surface, you can clearly see the spike proteins sticking off the end. I also want to highlight that this image is artificially colored, so all of your electron microscope images are always going to be black and white, and then they're typically digitally colored to try to highlight differences in what you're observing. One last image, this is another one that shows viruses, but this is a bacteriophage. So these are all viruses that are infecting this cell here, which is a bacterial cell. And in fact, you can actually see some viruses that have already gotten inside. Hopefully now you understand the basic differences between light and electron microscopes, and would be able to determine which type of microscope would be better to use in a given scenario.